Hey everybody, I have some great news for you. This is, uh, you might usually skip the intro. You definitely wanna gonna want to hear uh, this one. Some major updates. Uh, one that will um, directly, an action that you will need to take to take advantage of it. The other, just an amazing bonus that you're going to uh, naturally get going forward. So first and foremost, I am going to be wrapping up doing ads on the show. Uh, I have um, some contracts and stuff with the uh, with the lovely sponsors that I have had um, supporting the show. But I, uh, I, you know, when I first started the podcast six and a half years ago or whatever, I was really committed to never having ads on it. And then I uh, kind of got talked into experimenting with it and liked it and was um, more open-minded about the idea and have, have enjoyed all of the uh, support. And, uh, and things change. And now there's lots more opportunities with Things like Patreon, which, for example, I'm, I just started doing a board game night on my Patreon. I'm doing the first one um, coming up this week, and I'm going to do more of that. And then there's just a, a lot more I'm going to be adding, uh, like, a, a tip button, basically, on, on YouTube and a few other things like that to make it easier for you guys to express your generosity and support me directly and uh and um just have more control over and if you're like but i i really like hearing all of the ads well unfortunately we're no longer going to be interrupting uh the show midway through uh at least by march um for ads so sorry about that but i still have partners i'm still going to have libro.fm the audiobook company who i've really really enjoyed um working for that i'll be plugging um sometimes at the beginning and the end of of shows and putting in the descriptions and stuff and and lost sailor design who uh does leather work that i've that i sell when i'm on the road and everything uh, and these kind of independent companies that i that i personally work with things like uh like michael meditations by the way um uh, with COVID and everything else. First, I got a thing. We, we pushed everything back when my next trip to Jamaica was going to be, and then they've changed ownership, and a bunch of things have happened with that. So, Michael Meditations may or may not be happening um, in, in the future with uh, Here We Are uh, podcast, but that was a fantastic partnership, and I look forward to getting more more things like that um uh, partnerships with with things that i really believe in and and uh less less just selling ads and having a, a, no more breaks um in the show and and whatnot so really looking forward to that i hope you are as well number two uh this is i'm so excited i'm not going to spoil too much just yet because we don't know exactly how long it's going to take to build up to the launch um but we started recording and have now started editing and figuring out our game plan for promotion me and ramin nazer my very good friend ramin nazer who is hilarious and creative used to edit this show so he knows his way uh, around science a bit and uh and is has his own podcast rainbow brain skull hour and terrific artist and hilarious comedian and wise um funny interesting uh guy who makes me laugh harder than anyone and is so thoughtful and quick in the perfect balance uh for my long droning on uh about about these the concepts that i that i love go taking a huge deep dive into and so we started recording uh, a, a podcast that we're doing together we have a name but i'm not going to share it because we might just on the off chance we're going to change it but 
I'm really, really excited. Um, and that'll be the same thing, ad free, everything else. Um, it's a, it's a new year. Have have some new projects, some new experiments, some things I've been playing around with. Lots more to come, um, but uh, just establishing some of the things that I've I've been working towards that are um, uh, that are easier or more solid to implement. Anyway, and I'll continue experimenting and and uh and tweaking things as uh it's been quite the adventure having <laughs> having my whole life flipped upside down like so many other people uh because of uh because of of covid and so uh, making the most of it making making some continuing to make improvements on the quality of this show and and add new shows for your enjoyment and the main thing one of the big reasons not doing ads anymore i'd rather uh i i would rather just have you guys uh, appreciate the show, love it so much that you want to share it with more people. So if you like this show, that's that's what I'm after more than anything else. And, you know, hopefully we'll fi figure out ways to get support on Patreon and everything to pay for the uh, <laughs> to pay for all this stuff. But um, I uh, I really would would like to see um this this build and grow and i was quite honestly pretty frustrated early on last march when i thought this would have been the perfect if ever there was a time for people to get interested in science i would have thought for sure 2020 would have been the time and i was discouraged and i was frustrated and throwing a lot of spaghetti against the wall and losing my income from not live touring and everything else and uh and from that i i get the vibe that uh you know people weren't quite ready um then but i i think the world's a change and and i i think the the world is getting more and more ready uh, to get into hearing about the kinds of topics that we discuss on the show and being more interested in hearing from these amazing academics that you're never going to hear anywhere else. Just amazing people doing amazing work. A lot of them don't even have a social media account or anything. Um, or, you know, they, they didn't get in this for... For, they're not a scientist for the spotlight or the money. They just love science. And and uh, and so I, I absolutely love that. I, I you know, mo most every single podcast in the world is about how can I uh, establish myself to get bigger and bigger guests. And whoa, can you believe they got this huge celebrity on their podcast? And uh, with with few exceptions of, of maybe getting like a, a Dan Ariely, which you know it, it might be famous in the science community, but but uh, but it, there's you know bench warmers in sports that have a bigger following, and uh, and th this this show is about giving a voice uh, to people doing amazing work that often um, the public doesn't get to hear from. So it's a mission that's very important to me. I wish I did an even better job of it. it always, always give suggestions of what I can do to do more, to, to do better, to make things more interesting, to get more guests that, that um, you guys like. Uh, uh, by the way, you might notice some of the suggestions uh, you get sometimes someone wants like the the fringe like this person's digging up ancient cities and pyramids and so and that's just not the kind of stuff that we do on here so i apologize i appreciate if you like that stuff but i want to introduce people to how uh the actual regular scientific method works how academia works because Reality is pretty gosh darn interesting as well. 
gosh darn it just caught myself saying gosh darn it thought i'd double down why not so uh, just great news i'm very excited new year trying to keep that energy going to uh, launch some new things and i hope that uh that that um the enthusiasm is a, a little bit uh contagious and uh and you check out some new projects that i have launching going forward and just support any artist that you're into generally uh if you like someone let uh let the world know post about the shows and the podcast that you listen to and everything else on social media it helps so much you guys are awesome enjoy today's episode are we yes where are we here why are we here not entirely clear we are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all it's immensely bizarre here we are hello everybody and welcome to the here we are podcast i have return guest joel sus is joining me today from wichita state university uh, man, I, you know, Joel, I find myself thinking about you, uh, more than a lot of guests because you just have this, this, I'm scared. S- s- it's such an interesting niche that you have. I just remember, <laughs> I just like, I love the mindset of someone that just like finds a thing and just like starts like digging into it on their own, like a ton and find like, like I've been going through a sloth phase recently. And I'm just like obsessing about sloths and I know more about sloths than any normal person should. And you just, well, what's so peculiar is that you were like in Australia, which yes. isn't like the biggest, you know, police state or whatever, not many guns or anything else. And you just found yourself like, obsessed with the ins and outs and the workings of kind of security and gun safety and all these things and you're like i gotta get to america <laughs> that's right did, did, did i su- did i sum it up okay was that a fair yeah pretty much you know um in in australia um the gun laws are, are much more restrictive than they are in the united states and in in a lot of places around the world and that's because um, back in the, I'm not very good with the dates, but 80s, 90s, there was a couple of big mass shootings, like big, maybe even by American standards, by modern American standards. And they they really stood out. And the, the government at that time just said, mm, enough. And yeah. the, the gun laws were never, like people could never have, the things that they have here in America, even then, but it was it was um, guns were more accessible at that time, mm-hmm. and they had a kind of um, a bit of a moratorium. They they banned lots of different kinds of guns. They had a gun buyback, where you know they were they were going to take certain kinds of guns. You could get your money back, and you take them to this place. They had this big kind of crushing cutting machine, and they'd cut them in half right in front of you and 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 give you some money for them and you know it's it's not easy to have guns legally in australia mm. at the moment you've got to have a a reason uh to have them and self-defense is not a reason mm. there is no have a gun for self-defense there's things like you're a farmer and you need it for pest control uh you're a security guard or you're a hunter or you're a collector there's not an or, or for sporting purposes or you're a target shooter apart from that there's not very much and there's not many other ways as far as i know that you can le- legally have a gun and everything is registered um, they the police can come and check on how you're storing the guns uh and and they do come and do that and you've got to be members of member of a club you can't just like if you're a sporting shooter you have to be a member of a club that, you know, does target shooting. You can't just have it by yourself, and so it's 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 a different it's a different kind of setup there. 
Yeah. To do and, it, and it wasn't even just that you like had some like love of of like guns like in the way that you'd think like dreaming of like being rambo or something you you, you just you that's you were the just best, that's the best movie ever made <laughs> you think what so? are you no but have you have you have you ever I read that, uh, have was, you, i mean it was a big part of my childhood that's have for you sure. ever read the book first blood no which is I what haven't. the movie that is a really good book, and it doesn't end like the movie ends. Hmm. He dies at the end. Oh, wow. Well, um, now I don't need to. <laughs> now you don't know. Sorry. Spoiler alert. Um, that was a really that was a really good book. Now, that, that, was, that was in my childhood, but I, I'm, I'm kind of puny. I'm, I'm never going to be Rambo. Oh, yeah, but you. Uh, the point is, 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 that, is, is that it's not... I mean, I I imagine you probably like going for target practice and stuff, but it but it was it was more it was more of just like you really liked just understanding the various concepts of all kind of security related things and cameras and things, yeah. and just just the idea of it and 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 got researching it and and. It, you, it, it was you were you almost kind of were self-taught right if i remember and then and then and then went and pursued degrees that would allow you to yeah do I think, further i i think that's a good way of describing it you know, i was getting every book that i i could back then that was kind of related to to this stuff there wasn't there wasn't much out there and i still don't think that there's that much out there but I was getting what was what was available, and that was before internet and before you know Amazon. And so sometimes it took a long a long time to get stuff. And but, but well, when I was your age, in, we had to back in walk, my day, walk uphill both ways to the local <laughs> library. And but yeah, that that's what I did, and I I really didn't. Um, get into the academic stuff i didn't even think of think of that then at all and i you know i don't want to rehash i can't remember you know it doesn't matter what i told you uh, just just assume no one uh, heard or remembered the first one because we have a lot of new listeners and it's been a couple of years there you go so my first undergraduate degree was in human movement in australia that's what we call kinesiology sports science that kind of thing and i remember at the time that i had I had a friend who i was studying with and she was doing human movement but she was also doing another major she was doing this thing called psychology and i remember thinking probably saying to her why would you study psychology that just that just sounds terrible, you know, <laughs> people and their problems and who, who cares? I want to get into the head of someone who would want to study psychology just so I could know what they were thinking. Yeah, I was, you know, I was into the all the, all the muscle stuff and exercise physiology and biomechanics and I didn't have a clue about anything that was happening in, in, in people's heads. I wasn't interested in it. And then, you know, I felt pretty stupid many years later when I finally, you know, got into this uh, police and security stuff and, and decision making. And I eventually, just through sitting online um, clumsily looking for stuff, ended up finding um, a guy who, who had been in academia and then had moved, created his own research company doing this decision making uh, stuff. And he'd written a book. And it was exactly what you said about the library, right? Going uphill both ways to the library. I, I found out that this book existed. This is, there's no Amazon or anything like that. So I went online at that time and looked which library had that book. And it was the State Library of Victoria. That's where I'm from in Australia, in, in Melbourne. And so the next day I took a tram. Oh, had to walk a little bit, but tram took me uphill and went to the <laughs> library, found the book, sat there, read the book. And, um, and then that was my, the start of my, my journey because I then wrote, after I read the book, I said, well, I think I finally found the thing that I'm interested in. And so I sent that company 
an email and I said, hey, if you want to, if I want to do this kind of stuff, how do I get into this area? And they said, well, you've got to go and study psychology. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> now I, I remember when I thought that sounded like the craziest idea ever. Um, but that's, yeah, that's, that's what I did. I kind of went back to university and, and started at the beginning and studied psychology and, and then ended up moving to the United States because in Australia there was just not really any way to to do that kind of research. The, the police forces are organised very differently there. They're organised on a, on a state level, not on a very local level. So there's really, now I'm forgetting how many states there are in Australia, which is terrible, but I think that there's eight states and territories. So there's really eight police forces and that's it. And every police force is huge and they all have the same uniform, the same guns, the same car. They all train at the same place within each within each state's police agency. And they're very kind of closed to the public, I would say. Mm. It's really not easy to make connections with them for the purposes of doing research. Mm. And so I, I did try to do that a little bit when I was in Australia, when I was doing my undergraduate studies and didn't have much success. And I, I had the opportunity to stay there and study firefighter decision-making. Um, you know, all the fires that are happening out on the West Coast um, or were happening on the West Coast of the United States. So that's a, just been a constant thing in Australia for, for many, many years, but we call them bushfires. And so I did a little bit of research in that area with firefighting, but I didn't want to do that for my PhD. I wanted to do police stuff. So... Mm. America it was. So so um, America police are just like, sure, come in. We'll show you you want well you want well, here's where we store all the drugs. You want to take a peek? <laughs> and then they go into schools, they're like, Hey kids, you wanna look at this gun? Isn't it awesome? <laughs> they're they're a little they've, more they're they've a little never, more welcoming. They've never shown me the drugs. Um, <laughs> have haven't you gone ever to, asked to see no, the drugs? <laughs> no, I'm too much of a nerd for that. Um, I've 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 never been to the drug room. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it's funny cause it's kind of a, it's kind of a double edged sword. They are much more open than police agencies in Australia, at least in, in my experience in, in general in the United States. At the same time, there's a lot of people who are very skeptical about, uh, university researchers and, you know, terrible liberal people who, are, are yeah, against, yeah. You know, as as right? we're seeing as we're seeing this year, it seems to be a very political, uh, yeah. a, a Democrats a, a, against uh, a, against police or whatever, and then there's a, 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 and then colleges are this li these liberal academic institutions, and so you, yeah. you might if you were looking at at the uh, you know uh, biggest cliche broad brushes of of anger or whatever and and stereotyping of of uh of groups in 2020 you would you would think yeah these ivory tower elitists probably wouldn't get exactly. along with the um with the blue exactly exactly and you know but i've i've encountered i've encountered both things but but generally i've I think I've had at least some success in establishing connections with with law enforcement agencies where I've been, and they've been, you know, incredibly helpful in being able to do research. And it's it's just convincing people that you're not against them. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Trying to trying to bring some science and and help police training and that kind of thing. Not not trying to show police as, as being bad yeah so um with uh, so with all that what, why don't you tell people what what it is that you actually do what's your what's your hmm. uh, area of study what's your what's your title oh i'm an uh, assistant professor of psychology okay and that that's pretty broad though right psychology is a, a it is, are, do you think they're ever just going to start breaking up? It, it is amazing <laughs> what goes under the umbrella of huh. psychology. It, 
it's uh, I, I don't know <laughs> I don't know if it will ever break up like you're talking about I've never quite thought of that before because I think it's already kind of broken up as it is yeah right because we've got clinical psychology which is what m most people think of when they think of psychology um, but then there's lots of other kinds of social psychology, psychology, evolutionary, is, yeah. computational psychology. There's neuroscience, which sometimes right. you find in psychology departments. There's um, industrial organizational psychology, developmental psychology, cognitive psychology, on and on and on. Yeah. Um, and so the area that I'm in, is called human factor psychology. And that's probably one of the least known areas of psychology. Wouldn't that be, a, it's just like psychology is so big. Like if you meet someone at a party, you know, and they're like, what do you do? Like, oh, I'm, I have a, I'm in the psychology department. That, that would tell me nothing. I think most people would think that you're probably Freud, right? That would be like the first yeah. guess. Very, very unlikely would people be like, oh, so like, what are you into, human factors or? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I still have um, friends who I've known for a long time and I tell them, I mean, human factors and this is the kind of stuff that I do. And then they'll call me up and say, I'm having a bit of a problem with, with <laughs> you know, I'm a bit depressed or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I'm I'm the worst person. I'm the least qualified, <laughs> worst person to come to for that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. I'm I am not. not uh, there, people are just calling you, and uh, d uh, like you're you're sitting there working on on ways to make better um, simulations to help police officers do their job better. And meanwhile, you're getting calls left and right of like, I just had this past childhood tra <laughs> trauma that I, I remembered. Can you help me? And, and people, people who know me would agree with, with what I say that I, I am the worst person to come to. I'm the last person you'd want to come to for help with anything like that. Um, I, so, yeah. so what is human factors? You know, by now, I should have this uh, really <laughs> great brief description of, of what it is. And, and I, I don't, um, but I'm, but I'm going to tell you. So human factors is really looking at how do we Im improve performance? in a combination of socio-technical systems, crazy words. It just means people and technology, people and tools, people and devices, people and computers, cars, planes, that kind of thing. So it's really how to design things and uh, whether it's work environments so that it, it works for people. The, the big cliche is that engineers are good at designing things, but they're not good at understanding how people think and, and use technology. So human factors is there to kind of, there's another term for human factors. Sometimes it's called engineering psychology. So you can think about it that way. How do you engineer a product, a device, an airplane cockpit, a, a self-driving car? so that it fits best with human capabilities. And most often we're talking about human cognitive capabilities. So how people pay attention to things, remember things, make decisions, make judgments. And the, the way that I describe it is just like you said, that psychology is this kind of amorphous thing where you've got all these different fields inside it. I think human factors is kind of the same way, mm -hmm. except that everyone's heard of psychology. Very few people have heard of human factors or human factors psychology. But once you kind of take a step through the door and into, I have this analogy that, that I use when I um, speak to people, students about this. It's like you're going into an office building and that whole office building 
is human factor psychology. And there's different floors in that building and different doors down different corridors. That's what it's like. Once you get into the human factors building, oh, now there's human factors as it relates to aviation and now as it relates to video games and um, surface transportation, which is cars and trains and th that kind of stuff. There's human computer interaction. How do you design phones and websites? So it's just there's so many different right. sub sub areas in there. Because and this is kind of like like the the way that a the way that someone really knows their way around a computer or or like you know Bill Gates or some computer <laughs> programmer might navigate their way around DOS or something like that is and that's very efficient for them or some hacker mm -hmm. or something like that. You build a a a, a computer which to an expert might seem counterintuitive, but is is for for to create in a simple um, user interface, exactly. you need to create the, you need to think about these human factors. If you think like, well, mask would actually work, help transmit a virus, but are people going to use them? People might, um, it might make sense for money, people to save money in some certain way, but behavioral economics actually shows people might save in a different way or, or this, uh, I promise this is the last example. <laughs> there's, there's, uh, These are good I, examples. I, I'm, I'm thinking of of when they first made made the internet, the interstate system, and they're like, "Well, what if we get bombed or something?" And you need to get from point A to point B as fast as you possibly can straight line it and let's just make these straight interstates and then what do you know the uh, driving in on a straight road uh, these these lines going by just hypnotize people until they fall asleep and drive off the road who knew that you actually need to put curves in the road a robot wouldn't do this. You wouldn't build a robot track this way. But when you're thinking about human factors, these are the things that you need to consider. Exactly. And, you know, there's things, human factors considers technology broadly. So it can be something high tech, computer, that kind of thing. But it can also be things like a door handle, right? So how many times have you gone up to a door that's really a push door yeah and you know you've pulled on the handle because it's been set up by someone to give you cues that or it's it, they're either ambiguous cues or they've put the kind of thing that you would grab onto and pull rather than just put like a metal plate that's flat that you can't grab onto that you have to push yeah. right that's that's human factors yeah. Yes, even things like that. Don't you dare get me started on bathrooms. <laughs> we, will, oh. we will take <laughs> it will take the next hour. We'll never even talk about your work. Are you kidding well, me? You're from Australia where they have uh, sometimes they have the urinals that go under the feet, the grates under the under oh, yeah. the feet. And, and, and so there's no, you're not standing in pools of other people's urine. What? How is that not standard across the people? People are like, oh boy, well, we can't have this. We can't have these globalists in this one world government. Do well, you can with urinals. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that much. You know, when you, when, when you mention urinals, there's a, there's a kind of classic story in human factors that I think uh, the story is about the urinals, the men's urinals at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. So, you know, men are terrible pigs and they make <laughs> horrible, horrible yes. messes when they, when, they, when they urinate. And so they were looking at how they could reduce <laughs> splashback. And apparently, just like with a tennis racket, there's a sweet spot of the urinal. And so... They, Amazing. So they ended up making these dots. S yeah, dots, but it was you a make fly. a game out of it. It was a fly. And they yeah. stuck this sticker of a fly there. And all of a sudden, people started, you know, directing their streams uh, yeah. towards the flies. And the flies were in the sweet spot. And apparently, that, you know, reduced the amount of maintenance that was needed in uh, those bathrooms, restrooms. Oh, you gotta! You just gotta put the rival 
sports team <laughs> logo right right there and and you'll never have a mess uh, <laughs> um, so so what what kind of what specific kind of human factors do you work with mm, so you know we're talking about that building with all these different human factors kind of rooms or, or you areas. You own that building. No. I don't, <laughs> okay. I don't know about half the rooms in that building. <laughs> they don't um, let you into many of those rooms. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's really strange that, you know, even within human factors, you know, people specialize in their areas and they won't know that much about uh, other areas. Like, yeah. There's, so... It's just, where where are you at in the human factor? Bill? You got a corner <laughs> office. They got you in the oh, mail room. What oh, you? I wish, I wish. <laughs> I think I I think I can claim that maybe I've got a bit of a corner office. At least I've got a view outside. So I'm I, I kind <laughs> there of there you go. Look I, at you. I kind of associate with um a a, a group called cognitive engineering and decision making and that's one of within the the human factors and ergonomic society that's one of the larger technical groups as far as as far as i understand and but but even within that there's kind of different different fragments so i if i say that i'm anything like give a name to something i say naturalistic decision making that's that's kind of a, a neat term and, yeah. and and that goes back to the maybe late 70s early 80s when um there were these researchers who were looking at the way that judgment and decision making research was was done at that time you know mainly at universities and it, it's it was using kind of word problems or or very very um structured problems with correct answers that were given to undergraduate students in a lab, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, well, this doesn't really help us understand how people make decisions out in the real world in, in naturalistic situations. And when you use the term naturalistic situations, it's really getting at things like uncertain situations, complex situations where there's multiple players involve dif different people with different goals. The goals may not even be clear at the time of what you're trying to achieve. There might be time pressure, stress, uh, the kind of things that you might encounter in, in the military, in aviation, in people who control nuclear power plants and make sure that they're running properly. And so they started stepping outside the lab and, and going to watch people in their environment and ask them about critical incidents that they have had critical decision making incidents and try and understand those things from a from a cognitive perspective so, so you got you got someone that's got like a sloth in a zoo they're learning everything about sloths then you got someone that's actually in costa rica looking at sloths and what they're how they're interacting and and uh and what other uh, different things in the environment because because in the in the zoo you're um you know you're not putting a jaguar in next to it and uh and and you're not putting uh some um near extinct bird that swoops down and gets them off of trees that i i'm actually embarrassed that i can't remember the name of off the top of my head because i should because i fancy myself a bit of a sloth expert. but uh, but um which kind of sloth do you prefer because I, well, I believe uh, that there's different there's, yeah, there's, there a few different one, there's the two main categories are the the two in the three finger Good. they're called two toe and three toe but they're they're fingers. fingers. I mean, or or you could, I mean, they're up, they're they're up here by yeah, by their yeah. heads. Their their feet, what I would call their feet, are all three fingers. So or or all three toes. Mm -hmm. And so to say toes is like a whole misleading thing. And there's a controversy about whether they should oh. change it. And uh, controversy in the sloth should, world. And if you ask me, just say they have four hands. If they're hanging upside down most of the time, like hands do, they're almost never on 
on the ground and so but yeah there's a lot of there's a lot more controversy than that in sloth world believe me but the the point is is that you're going to expect a very different outcome studying a rat in a lab than cons uh, than studying a rat in a new york city subway or something exactly and and this kind of area of naturalistic decision making really came about as a as a reaction to that lab-based um, research that often used these kind of canned problems, um, very clean decision-making problems, and it's it's a harpy eagle, by the way, that just of okay. course popped into my head and wasn't going a to go away eagle. unless I said it. So, all right, that's the prehistoric. <laughs> that's the prehistoric bird. Uh, no, it's a near. It's a it's a bird that still exists. That's yeah. that's um, responsible for like twenty percent of of sloth predation. Um, so anyway, go. <laughs> so, and so the other thing that this this area naturalistic decision making tries to focus on is not just not just being there, but being there and trying to understand how the experts operate. Like what's happening up here in the mind of an expert. That's what they're really trying to get at. Mm. And so that that's the other kind of area that I study or, or co complementary area is the study of experts and, and expertise. How is expertise attained? And there's, there's lots of other terms that are used for that, like accelerated expertise or accelerated learning. And that and can be you... in any domain. Are you mostly talking? Are we talking mostly law enforcement, or or do you do you factor in like you know how how security cameras might like better help a bank, or or what what kind of domains hmm. do you do you focus on? So, I've I've tended to focus on these naturalistic domains of firefighting, okay. a, a, aviation, police, military those kind of things. And, and when you think about it, there's a lot of work that people do nowadays that is cognitive. If you're sitting in front of a computer for most of the day, then most of the work that you're doing is, is cognitive work, right? It used to be a uh, hundred or so years ago, the, the, this study of, of expertise mainly focused on manual trades like bricklayers, right? Brick, bricklayers were really, really skilled how they're grabbing bricks and putting the mortar on, setting them and, and lining them up. And so uh, there were original studies of expertise that focused on that. They got early cameras, filmed people, slowed it down, look at how long it was taking them to, to grab a brick, apply stuff. And they were kind of efficiency experts. They were trying to make the whole process more efficient. Mm -hmm. Right. If we can put the bricks here closer to the bricklayer rather than a step away, then they'll be able to lay them more, may, lay them more quickly, and we'll be able to get more bricks laid per hour. And we'll be, you know, everything was kind of, you know, industrial was after the industrial revolution, I guess. But, but in that kind of vein, how can we make things more efficient? But at some stage in the 20th century, a, a lot of work transitioned from becoming but from being very manual to starting to be more cognitive. Mm. And so then people got interested in, well, what's happening cognitively inside people's heads that let them do tasks really well, or maybe faster than others, more accurately than others. And, you know, the probably the biggest area of expertise research, or at least in the beginning, is chess. And I, I'm kind of embarrassed. I've never played chess. I don't know how to play chess. Put a chess board in front of me. Not a clue. Would not know a pawn from a rook, from a king, from no a queen. One Do you want me to teach you how to play chess? Someone you, one day you, has you, to teach you. I, I will, because, and you'll probably even have a chance against me in your first game because I know the rules, but I'm, 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 I'm really, no expert. I think one of the reasons that I've kind of resisted <laughs> is because I'm scared what will happen if I start learning. I think it will take over my life. Not, not that I'll be very good, but I'll, but I'll want oh, to boy. get better. 
You're and, in trouble, Joel. The dam is breaking. The Queen's Gambit is so popular yeah, on Netflix now. That. Everyone's getting all excited about every chess thing. There's going to be a lot of people getting chess boards for Christmas yeah. this year, and I have a feeling you're going to be one of them. Oh, I don't know. You're in trouble. I, I, I did watch... 2021 <laughs> is going to be your 2020. <laughs> I, I did watch Queen's Gambit and, you know, I had no idea what was happening with all, you know, <laughs> with with any of the no pieces. No one knew any um, of those moves. But but I've I've read a bit about you know chess research and that that was a really nice. It's a really nice domain in which to look at expertise because even though there's a lot of moves, mm -hmm. there are rules and things are constrained, and you can ask people to predict someone's next move and. There's, there's, there's been just a lot of research about cognitive performance, memory, things like that uh, related to, to chess. And so, I don't know, in, in some way, I'm trying to apply some of that stuff, that some of that kind of approach to, to law enforcement, because I think that police officers deserve to have really good training. And I think society at large would want them to have really good training and it's yeah. not it's not that they they don't get good training um i'm sure that there's some places that give excellent training but there's it's very diverse the training because police uh, or law enforcement is so it's organized on such a local level here in the united states there's yeah. very many you can have lots of places teaching in different ways. And yes, there's there's some kind of state standards in, in most states, but there's also a lot of leeway in what, what happens within those standards. Mm. And, you know, police trainers have a really tough job. Mm. They've got to they've got to teach people to be kind of jacks of all trades. So instead of you got you got these human factors people going and studying people putting a brick down and mortar and each day they're getting slightly better and a little more efficient and keeping the bucket to the left side instead and the and they're getting more bricks down faster and it's holding better and the quality is improving as quantity is also increasing and that in in that little uh, uh zeroing in on how you make the fastest best little widget is a very different thing than making considerations like, okay, we got a fire here. Where's the fire hydrant? Do we need a helicopter to dump this and that exactly. on it? Do we have, uh, uh, do we, uh, you know, uh, uh, clear cut ahead of time? There's, there's, there's just, uh, there's just a lot more. You're going into a new environment and new situation and, each time. Yeah, and those environments, right? Like, you know, you used the the bricklaying example that that I raised. So that's a, a relatively stable environment right it's 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 pretty routine right yes you might be working on a different building but you're you're laying bricks and that kind of thing doesn't doesn't change very much whereas when we are talking so much smack about brick i know right now i think we I, better, better watch out or we're gonna get a, a brick a, through, a, the, a a brick through, through the window through the window with a note you think this is easy <laughs> luckily right now i'm on the i'm on the top floor of a building and on the fourth floor, and it probably might be hard for someone to, to get a brick up here. Oh, but, unless they just but, see that human factors label and yeah. then look four stories up and start launching. Yeah. So you you have uh, – the other thing is, is you have this kind of natural incentive. You're a company making brick homes, and someone goes, hey, I'm a scientist. I can come in here, and I can – figure out these things and I'm going to save you a million dollars a year because I'm going to get your crew working as efficient as you ever have. And here's how, and this is this very easy to measure thing. And in one week, you're going to see a difference because more bricks are going to be laid down. I don't see the same incentive with, uh, you, you know, a, a police, police training. That's a, that's a lot harder to measure. Oh, it, it really is. It's it's really hard to measure, and it's you know I think in general police do 
a, a tough job and an important job and a good job. But there are there are aspects of training that that could probably be improved and you know it's going to vary from from place to place but i've been i've been disheartened sometimes when i've observed training here and there where there's been very little reflection on um how things were handled mm. and and it's kind of it it was a situation where I'm just I'm just trying to think. I, I don't want to give too much give too much away in terms of identifying. Just kind of meta analysis. I I get done with a a show and I could I could be like, hooray! I crushed it and pat myself on the back and go home. But I'm I'm usually I usually benefit by like, oh, what what went well there? Could I exactly. I, I could have tweaked that joke. I could have cut that punchline. Yeah, that didn't work in so, this environment. So you're you're just engaging in metacognitive activity, right? Just you're thinking about your own thinking. You're reflecting on it and trying to work out exactly how how can I improve for the for the future? And that in my limited experience with law enforcement, that is missing a lot of the time. Mm. Um, it, it's it's more I've seen more of the thing where okay we finished the situation and it's done right dust your hands off pat on the back cool finished tie a bow in it move on to the next thing and never go back now I have met people who do the opposite of that that they're very very um, reflective after the fact and they'll even go and look at things that went right, things, you know, situations that they think that, that they handled relatively well, they'll go back and they'll question themselves and think, okay, it went pretty well and the outcome was good, but could I have done anything different? Did I miss something? Could I have said something differently? Did I compromise my, my safety at some point? Could I have stood somewhere else? That those kind so of things. Tons of individual differences, but as a standard thing, if if you could maybe improve one thing, it, it would be. Uh, I mean, how do you how do you improve something like that? It, it, to me, so, if I if I were to guess, it, I I would think I would think in in like a band of brothers situation, there might be some resistance to having kind of like a safe space for criticism. There. So this is this really frustrates me quite a bit um and maybe it maybe it's indicative that i don't kind of get the police culture because I'm, I'm not a police officer but there is you know broad brush strokes great generalizations there's there's a resistance to criticizing or it, it's not even i shouldn't even use the word criticizing critiquing Critiquing, right? That's Critiquing performance, because it's not about criticizing. That is just, you know, in in law enforcement, you'll often hear, you never critique a fellow officer, right? You weren't in their shoes. You don't know what they were going through. You you weren't there. They did as best as they could, and you 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 never critique it. That is just anathema to the whole idea of getting better and improving performance. And it's one of the things that, that really strikes me sometimes is, you know, a lot of police officers that I meet, as a lot of people who aren't police officers, are really into sport. Mm -hmm. And when you say, when you try and point out that, hang on, you're, <laughs> you're being really, um, re re you're really resisting someone you know, critiquing what you've done and trying to help you improve. But how do you think that all your sport heroes, Oh man! what do you think that they do after every game? And what do you do to them? Yeah. Right? As a Monday morning, you know, quarterback, what do you do to them? You're not in their shoes, but now all of a sudden you think that you can, you know, cr critique them and, 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 and give them feedback. So it, it kind of, there's this, there's this disconnect that I, that I, I don't get. 
it you you are you're speaking my language uh, set you know set aside the uh, you know specific example <laughs> of, of that you just used but just generally speaking in terms of uh, in terms of a huge science literacy problem within the public there's this idea that like some people are dumb and some people are smart or something like that or some people are but like everyone, uh, whoever you think is the dumbest guy in town, I guarantee you they're better at statistical reasoning than you think they are. Just set them in front of their favorite sports team or have them <laughs> place a bet on, on their team. And all of a sudden they can understand statistics and do data analysis just fine and they and they can pull back and be be object they might root for the home team but if they're gambling on a game they know perfectly well how Ooh. to pull back and and have an objective uh, point nice. of view and what trade who should be traded where and what how good an actual player is that that reminds me of a of a story that's used i think it's when i teach cognitive psychology um that there's a story about some researchers in Brazil a while back who were looking at street kids who were selling. Um, I love that story. Yeah, I've heard it. Okay. Yeah. No, so, no, share it. I don't. Oh, I don't think my. I don't think my listeners have ever heard this story. So, uh, I'll, hopefully, I'll get it right. That so there are these street kids who you know stand at intersections and sell people candy and drinks and things like that. There was they're, a there was a school there was an issue with the the school system and and they weren't able to house as many uh, as many children and a lot of children were left being uh, uneducated. Yeah, so they they didn't have any formal education, yet they were able to do you know relatively complicated math in the context of right someone wants two candies and, I, and and they gave me this much money and i've got to give them this much change but if you ask them to just put a math problem in front of them right an a contextual math problem they they couldn't really do it but they don't know how how uh, how long it would take the train to get from here to there if debbie did this and that unless debbie was going to buy some of their merchandise <laughs> when they <laughs> when they got right. off that train and then they made a perfect calculation yeah so oh that's a that's a neat example that you gave about you know the the betting and the and the statistical literacy so yeah, so that that's something that, um, you know, I, I don't think it's just with police officers. I mean, cl clearly it isn't. There's just there's lots of people who don't like to be critiqued. Mm -hmm. They just they want to just go on their way and be how they are, and it <laughs> it, it 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 takes. So I I think it does take some. I don't know if, if moral character is, is the right word. Right? If you're inviting... Intellectual humility, maybe? Yeah. Just, you know, if you're inviting uh, critique, you know, you're going to hear some things that you don't like, right? And, right. Then, and then you've got to deal with them. And then there's potentially the cognitive dissonance that, oh, I'm not doing things the right way like i could be doing things differently now i've got it crap i've got to put more, <laughs> i've got to put more effort in so i can reach that next level but i don't know i i i'm kind of lucky in where i'm at at the moment as as an assistant professor who has some graduate students in their lab that i students learn that that's how it's going to be yeah. from pretty early on and you know i i'm not a very touchy-feely person maybe some people will say i'm not that nice but when i give when i give people feedback it's because it's only because i care right yeah. and i want them to give i mean i invite feedback too i know yeah. sometimes it may not be right it's gonna suck sometimes but if it's gonna help me get better at whatever it is i do then i want to hear it yeah, I always read my YouTube comments and stuff. And I, you know, you gotta be mindful of negativity bias and whatnot. But it doesn't. If someone just like makes fun of like my hair or doesn't like my voice or you know what, like <laughs> that that stuff just doesn't bother me at all. Or right, no, but, no, sure. but but once in a while, 
someone will be like, ah, I saw what they're going for here, but they missed the mark because of it. And I'm like, Ooh, damn, they're actually right. <laughs> <laughs> those are the, those are the ones that sting, but those yeah. are the ones that you, that you learn from. Yeah. And that's, I just think that's how it is. And in, in academia, at least people get used to that and they kind yeah. of buy into a system of that through this whole peer review process, right? You write a paper, you submit it to a journal, you send it off, and then it gets it gets reviewed by peers who you, you don't know who they are. And then you get this feedback back, and it just says normally, you know, reviewer one, there's no names, it just says reviewer one, or reviewer two says, you know, you suck, and your whole approach sucked, and everything was bad, and, you know, we don't, we don't think that this should get published by, by this yeah. journal or, or, you know, things were reasonable, but you should consider this and make these changes, right? It, it can vary. There's, there's, a, there's a huge scope, but that's just, that's built into the system. And it's yeah. there because people, no one person can think of ev everything and cover everything. And so that's you, harder too, because my YouTube comments, someone can criticize me. I'm like, well, that person's probably an idiot. But <laughs> if you're getting peer reviewed, you're like, ah, crap, that person's probably very well educated. Yeah. And so, knows what they're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's funny because you, you mentioned, you know, looking at comments and that, that kind of thing. Um, so it was a few years ago now I, I did this. Um, online study about gun safety and gun safety knowledge. And so I needed gun owners to complete it. And so one of the things that I did was I went, I, I just typed online, found the the biggest gun forums there is. I went on there, found some, some board, made a thread. Hey, here's a research study looking at thing. It would be great if, if you, you could um, take the time to complete it. And I put it up there and then I went back the next day. Oh my gosh, just comments, this liberal ivory tower, you know, against the second amendment. And there was nothing against, you know, second amendment, anything it wasn't about that at all. I don't think yeah. that they'd even looked at the, at the, at the study, at the survey. And right. then, so what one, a few people started writing that. Then someone goes here, I found his picture online. This is him. Someone else writes back, looks like he has cancer. Um, <laughs> and just went on and on. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a human factor for you. Yeah, it is. My and, goodness. People are the worst. And I, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, naturalistic decision is studying naturalistic decision making and human factors in um, things like uh, police, military, whatever. This this seems like it. One, I'm wondering is is this brand new and and how good of a time is it? It seems. I guess I'm asking because I'm thinking about body cameras. Mm -hmm. This has to make. Um, uh, your job so much easier. This has to make the opportunity whether it's used or not mm. um uh for um for meta analysis you know this is like the coach being able to watch the play by play afterwards are our body cameras viewed in that way or are they viewed as like police like all oh, these pesky big brother things mm. that that are just going to get me in trouble or or are, are police like terrific i get to put my body camera on and hear all about the things that i can improve upon <laughs> um so you you first asked about you know is this naturalistic decision making a new thing and it's not it's been around since you know at least the early 80s so it it's that's not new mm -hmm. um but it is, it's still kind of a niche area, even within human factors. So, you know, for example, I think the best, the best example is that every two years, the naturalistic decision-making kind of group of people have a conference and there are about, around about 200 people come to that conference. That's a 
pretty small conference compared to to other to the regular human factors conference or to the to big psychology conferences where you'll get thousands and thousands of people so it's it's still it's kind of a niche area um that's naturalistic decision making but in terms of you know what you're talking about with body cameras that's there's been a boon in in criminal justice and criminology research they've just gone whole hog in the last maybe five years or so with with body camera stuff there was a lot of money thrown at body camera research and it was mainly not not looking at oh we can assess people's performance or we can use it for to reflect on for training purposes it was mostly we're introducing body worn cameras as a way to keep tabs on people and a way to try to reduce um, complaints against police and police use yeah, of force liability. against uh, against citizens, and so there was. Uh, I'm not um, I'm not the expert on on that research. I'm, I'm familiar with it to the extent that there's been quite a bit of it in the last few years, um, and and really looking at the effects of body worn cameras on um, use of force incidents how much force is used when police do use force, how many complaints do citizens make against police um, when the body cameras have been introduced. Uh, I mean, how do you measure something like that? How do you how do you measure their use of force if they're when they are wearing a camera and not wearing a camera? Do so, you, like, do you... So I mean, what's, how... what's... Again, I'm going to just put a caveat and say that that's not, that's not research that I've done, but I'm think I'm familiar enough with it to to answer that question that so like they do in medicine with drugs they have randomized controlled trials they try to do those kind of things in criminal justice and and law enforcement so what is what does that mean it's what they'll do is they'll try to identify there's two main ways one is that they'll find a jurisdiction that's about to introduce body-worn cameras and they'll find a comparable jurisdiction, kind of same size, same kind of de demographic makeup that's not yet implementing body-worn cameras and they will they'll measure use of force incidents, you know, well, those kind of things are tracked to some extent. So they'll measure it before the body cameras are introduced in, in the one place and then they'll keep measuring it afterwards and uh -huh. they'll see is there a change in the jurisdiction that uses body-worn cameras and no change in the jurisdiction that that hasn't yet implemented body-worn cameras you you could even do that within a city if you have offices that are um you know tied to a location right these these offices belong to to this um this bureau or this this division of the police in this city so you could introduce it to that place first see how it goes and you leave other jurisdiction other places within within the city without the body cameras for a, a small amount of time and then kind of introduce them you know in a phased way and see if that if that makes a difference so that's that's some of the way that they that they do those kind of studies mm. Hmm. And then, and then they'll also sometimes go and survey citizens to see how to see their responses. How, do they think that body cameras have made a difference? To, you know, try and find people who have had interactions with the police. Have they found that those interactions have been different since the police have had body cameras they'll find police perceptions of the body cameras there's there's all kinds of different facets of body camera worn research do you off the top of your head have a ballpark of a guess of of where that where that kind of trends in, in terms of outcomes all i know is that there has been i think at least one recent meta-analysis and to the to the best of my recollection the evidence was ambiguous so th there was evidence on both sides that body-worn cameras had a positive effect 
that body cameras had no effect, that body cameras had uh, actually, it seemed like they made things get worse, which is kind of really strange. It is, and thus it's like, uh, and thus it's like how, uh, you, you know, like, um, Insta, like YouTube makes people do crazier <laughs> things or like jump off higher roofs yeah. or whatever. It could uh, maybe, be. Maybe some cops are are like, wait till my buddies see uh, uh, see how I took down this guy or something like that. Um. So I I don't think that there's. A consensus yet about it that's that's at least as as far as I understand um, but I think the point has to be made that you know compared to lab-based research in just for example psychology this is way different right this is dealing with um, real problems you know with real people in real life trying to measure things that are not that easy to measure and so you'd probably expect some some noise in the in the results or some some variability depending on exactly you know it can depend on so many things how the cameras are implemented how officers are trained to use them the kind of um, the, the population that's being policed there's just so many factors that that are in there so i mean my my not knowing anything um uh, about about the subject my my gut tells me that like what it seems like a win-win for a, a police force if not a given police officer but yeah. but even it's, say i imagine a lot of people i i've never had I've never had, if I'm being honest, I've never had the greatest fondness for the type of person that wants to become a police officer. However, I, I would think that they genuinely uh, do care about wanting to serve the community and do good and blah, blah, blah. And I, I probably just have a uh, shitty little rebellious teenager still stuck in my head that refuses to mature. But um, uh, but regardless, uh, I, I would think that one, you know, as a police officer, sometimes you want to use force and, and, you know, someone has bruises and whatnot afterwards. If this is recorded that it was a, you know, this legitimate act, yes. that's a, uh, then, then you don't need to rely on your word. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, two, this is, um, this is some, you're, you're going to get just less complaints of, you know, someone, yeah. someone saying, no, I actually was cooperating when you can see on the camera that they obviously were and, not cooperating. And that's, that's, I've heard anecdotally of exactly that happening. So, um, here in Wichita, the officer who was responsible for implementing body worn cameras at Wichita police department told me that he had cases where citizens wanted to make a complaint against the officer after they'd introduced body worn cameras. And so he'd say, no problem. Um, that officer was wearing a, a body worn camera. Um, I'm going to get that footage so we can sit down together and, and look at it and, and see what the officer did. And he said that there were instances where the, where the citizen very quickly withdrew their complaint and said, oh, I, I, okay, well, it actually wasn't like that. It wasn't that bad. And, you know, because the story goes that they were probably in some way being an ass and yeah. the, the, the citizen. And once they realized that that would have been recorded and it it's wasn't kind of like when you hook someone up to a fake lie detector, you tend to get more honest answers out of them. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because, you know, a lot of police departments still require um, a polygraph as part of the, you know, employment process. Well, I, I'm Selection not even, I'm not even, that's not a matter of me questioning the legitim the yes. legitimacy of polygraphs, which we certainly could do that. That is to say that like in, in studies, they'll tell someone that they're on a polygraph yes. and they in fact are not. And, and often people, uh, in, in that experimental condition tend to, uh, uh, um, uh, over, uh, divulge more information than, than people. Yeah. So that's for it. So, yeah, I think in, in general, the body worn cameras are, are a good thing. And you asked, you said it's kind of a boon for my kind of research. 
and so you'd you'd think so, um, but there's but there's problems with that to to some extent, and one of them is that there's so much footage that's recorded, Mil- millions and millions uh, of hours, so it becomes uh, a problem of trawling. It's impossible to trawl. Th- it's impossible for people to trawl through all that. And so it becomes a it becomes an artificial intelligence problem. Can't you what what's the um what's that weird word? Uh, oh man, I always screw it up. The it almost sounds like a um foreign country or something like that. You, you know you know the studies on I. Uh, the you you give a survey online you you pay someone like a couple dollars to do a yes uh, Amazon Turk. Turk yeah 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 Me- yeah mechanical uh, Turk a, a mechanical Turk yeah uh, so so you 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 pay people uh, ten cents a survey or whatever to fill these things out you would th- they just took the show cops off the air yes. you, you would think you could almost set that out and, and and be like hey just let us know when you get to the good stuff maybe maybe that would be a, a public domain or a, uh, a a government privacy type of thing where you wouldn't just put that out on the public right. anyway it, see, it seems like there would be a way of of well, someone would be able to get down to the good stuff for you to show I, um, I think that the the way that things are headed, in, in the future from what I understand of it is that there's people who work in the field of computational vision or com- computer vision and artificial intelligence working on this kind of problem so that you can have all the footage sitting there and algorithms will go through it and basically classify the video, uh, classify it as, okay, this is a traffic stop. This is a domestic violence situation. But it, then even more than that, it'll be able to analyze to some extent what's happening in the video, how many people are there in the video. It'll be able to analyze the audio to look at stress in people's voices. So, you know, is there lots of shouting? Is this a more tense situation? And then through that, it'll be able to kind of pop the ones that that most need attention, whether it's from a a police supervisor who needs to review those kind of incidents. I think that's what's kind of happening in the future. Even the kind of thing where you could automatically give a score for, for example, procedural justice. How much procedural justice did the officer kind of give or offer in this situation and that could be fed back to the officer and they could go oh, i only got a 78 this time oh i've got to gamify i've got to gamify things right now my 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 fellow officer they they just did an, a traffic stop and they got an 87 oh, i got to beat them next time it, it things could be going that way interesting huh in in the, in the future so yeah but, but for me at the moment um I'm, I'm working on a project that's funded by the National Institute of Justice that is kind of looking at part of this issue. It's trying to use body-worn camera footage as a basis for decision-making training for police officers. And so right now, as we speak, in, in the middle of trying to find good videos to use for the kind of training that we're interested in doing. And that's proving to be more challenging than we thought. Mm. And the reason is that there's lots of videos out there on on YouTube, but most of the things that find their way into the public domain like that are there because they end up in kind of terrible incidents or, you know, shootings or some use of force and, and that kind of thing. But that's not most situations. Most situations don't end up like that. You're so you're not getting a lot of you're not getting a lot of footage of the of the like wow that person really had 
that that officer had terrific like bedside manner and exactly. wrote the appropriate speeding ticket but no one uh, everyone got along just fine and they right. shook hands and sometimes you see videos of oh this this cool officer was dancing with the with the local people and and doing some hip hop dance or something like that and they're cool and they and they're you know <laughs> right, establishing right. good relations with the community which is great but yes the yeah. the, the videos that that end up being online are biased towards the ones where stuff, you know, where that kind of stuff happens. And so there's this whole, if you can imagine that there's the whole world of body camera footage, there's this yeah, you got, tiny speck you got a, that we see. Uh, what you, you got like this whole so jungle canopy you're looking out over and you almost need like an artificial harpy eagle that can spot the sloth that's risen up a little too high to bask in the sun there you go swoop down and then nice that's analogy. what you need <laughs> so so we're so we're trying to 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 deal with with that kind of problem at the moment of finding the right kind of footage because the other thing that tends to happen with these videos when police do, do sometimes use them for training and lots of people watch them, lots of police officers watch them, but most of the time they watch them from the perspective of the tactics, right? What, what did the officers do in terms of tactics? Because the, the primary thing is officer safety and which is a very important thing. But what we in this study that I'm involved in at the moment, what we're trying to focus on are these cognitive skills that underlie expert performance in naturalistic domains. Mm. And not not so much on the tactical end of things when things kind of go bad. We're looking at things like people's ability to read situations and understand the kind of uncertain situation that they're in, be able to anticipate how that situation may play out, look at um, things that we call goal conflicts. So when you're faced with a situation where you've got at least two goals that are competing, right? You might need to protect someone, but you also need to protect yourself. And by you protecting someone, you're putting yourself more at risk. And these are the things that are really tricky to kind of resolve in a split second manner. And so they're the things that don't typically get trained or get trained less in police training. If I was, you know, again, broad brush, a lot of the training is on, on the tactics and, and using the force and positioning and those kind of things, the physical skills that officers might need, right? Um, defensive tactics, or how they're going to put hands on people and cuff them and shooting skills and less of an emphasis on the decision-making side, right? How are people processing information? How are they picking out the relevant cues in a situation and, re and putting them together so that they can read the situation accurately and decide what to do? So that's what, that's what we're trying to focus on. Amazing. So... Um, if I can ask, I, I mean, you can, I'm just going to leave this very open ended so you can take whatever stab at this you want, but sure. 2020 has been, uh, has, has been a wild year for lots of things all around. And you and I, we, we look at events through different lenses mm -hmm. than, then what is you know going to be shown on whatever mainstream media channel or whatever the normal talking heads are going to see because we have these different areas of expertise or study and i i look at this situation of of a virus going around and people not wrapping their hands heads around like asymptomatic spread and i'm like geez guys i wish i could just sit down everyone and talk about the evolution of disease avoidance and and what makes asymptomatic spread so sneaky and why because everyone looks so healthy it's a it's a tricky kind of thing consciously <laughs> to wrap your head around and yes. and if everyone if it were the case uh, we've evolved if it were the case that everyone was like that had covid was immediately choking on their own lung fluids in public everyone would be 
distancing and blah, blah, blah. And because our evolved brains aren't meant to uh, kind of understand that or things like climate change that are like these slow changes mm -hmm. over time and are seemingly kind of asymptomatic, like... Boy, if you just had this information, you would see you would see this a little bit differently. And uh, is, is there is there anything with kind of your your field of study that that um, it, you you wish people were uh, just a little bit more knowledgeable about when it comes to um, you know obviously we've had uh, we've had protests we've had the mm -hmm. um, defund the police, uh, which may have been a, a poorly named um, marketing uh, thing from from, uh, yeah. from 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 someone who uh, very much um, was hoping um, Trump would lose when that when when defund the the police started. I was like, "Ooh, well, I'm from the Midwest, and I don't think that slogan is going to." going to do do the democrats any favors like right. they think that it might and and so is there is there anything that um that you've seen where where maybe maybe just a a a little bit of uh if not science literacy just just things that are specific in your domain that you wish the whole world knew about and would maybe help make a, a little more sense of some of the things going on I think so science literacy is is huge and uh i think that's a, a big problem facing the country and, and the world that's not not easily solvable uh but you know what just just to pick one thing this just happened recently right joe biden this was before the election but in the last sometime in the last two months right he said publicly well you know why didn't the police officer just shoot him in the leg right and that's that just shows a real lack of understanding about mm -hmm. the limits of human performance under stress um you know lots of people say that and it would be great. Like I, yeah, I see it in movies all the time. Right. They just they just shoot the gun out of their hand <laughs> why, yeah. and 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 that's that's kind of a, a tragic thing that ho Hollywood or the movies has, has led us to believe that that's possible, right? Dirty Harry, he can he can just do those kind of things, and that. Did, did you see the Ballad of of Buster Scruggs or whatever, by the way, on Netflix? On Netflix, I'm probably saying that no, wrong. No, I don't think so. Oh, I should. The ballad. Oh yeah. Okay, it's, I'll look it's it up. Fantastic. Uh, anyway, there, there's a there's a terrific like comedic play on that of like holding up a mirror and like shooting oh. behind the head with like perfect accuracy and the, it's very fun. Well, there's you know there's those trick, I think they call them trick shooters who do you know those kind of things, yeah. um, but that's not, you know, think about a world level champion in something and how much practice they would have had to get to that level that's those kind of people police officers generally get r relatively little training or a little time spent on you know firearms training and a lot of the time it's done in ways that don't maximize the transfer to real world performance so they'll be standing in front of paper targets that aren't moving that they don't have to communicate with and they're just you know there's there's no threat to the back to the officer um that's that's the majority of firearms training at the moment and then you know it, it's it's a nearly impossible ask to to get someone to be able to hit someone in the arm or the hand or the leg or you know something like that maybe even under ideal conditions and then you start you know, and then you still have to spin the gun and put it in your holster after that because sure. otherwise what's the point of shooting a gun out of someone's hand if you don't finish it don't don't correctly. laugh when i when i was in grad school at michigan technological university up the, the the far north of michigan it's one of the few universities as far as i understand that had its own shooting range uh -huh. and they had a, an underground kind of in a basement somewhere and 
they there was a gun club that trained there and sometimes they would get you know new shooters who were interested there was someone who did exactly that and shot themselves one day they <laughs> they they you know someone was instructing them i don't know exactly how it happened but they did exactly that they said oh i finished shooting and and they shot themselves in the stomach i think now see this this brings up another thing cuz i know another amazing area of research and we talked about it last time was about some gun safety because mm -hmm. because you 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 teach gun safety correct and i, I used I, to be involved you, in some firearms you, training you used you used to be involved in some firearms training now as someone who has like a gut, guns aren't my favorite thing in the world and and people are often like well, people don't like guns because they're liberals that have never been around them and seen how cautious, like, no. No, I don't like guns because I've been around a lot of drunk hunters with guns that are like, uh, think they're tough guys and, and doing oh uh, crap like that all the time. That's why I, I, I don't I don't like guns because I don't think you need to bring a bazooka into a subway uh, for self-defense, which is another thing that's happened in, in 2020. I don't think sniper rifles are the best thing for self-defense, but Yes. My biases aside, we talked last time uh, 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 about. Did I just say that really? We, we talked last time. There was like some weird inflection in my voice uh, <laughs> about how um, you, despite there not having a a kind of system for um, implementing what what would be like the equivalent of a driver's test, mm -hmm. which is like showing people videos and and things which I, I would love if you would re-explain for people but but despite that not being a mandatory thing you do you do find that the average gun owner does seem to like really know their way around at least when they're sober um well i, I don't know about i don't know what an average gun owner is i think that yeah. i think that there's definitely people who are into guns who probably you know uh, uh, pretty safe and they understand yeah. that kind of stuff but I'm, I don't know I've got no details about the breakdown I think that there's a lot of people who have guns who aren't really into guns and don't really you know they, they have it in case they need to use it but they yeah. don't spend a lot of time kind of understanding how it works and look there's there's an argument about that right if you drive a car do you need to know how the car works to be able to drive a car um right. not really but you need to know how to operate it safely right, right? And this is can you explain kind of some of the videos that, that yeah um so so you, what I, I want do you do you have like a file of these that you could send me that we could insert in the in the i've activity? i've even got a I do. I mean, I've got all the I've got all the videos, but I've also got uh, basically a study online that people can go and and do it and work their way through it and see it if they're if they're oh, interested. Oh, let's, let's just do that. It, it just it just kind of on video shows a bunch of different circumstances of like here I'm putting a clip in. I'm showing you this. This yeah. how many bullets are in it. We clip it in. We pull this back. We do this with the safety. What happens when I pull the trigger? Does it discharge a, exactly. a, a, a bullet or not? And and see how well people do. Yeah, and um, you know, I I did that based on you know a long time ago when I was involved in some firearms training, and I wanted to kind of make sure that the people I was training understood how the gun worked and when it was going to go bang and when it wasn't. So I, I devised this kind of test that I gave them in person, right? I'd have them standing there. I'd have a, a, a clipboard and it had maybe about 30 steps in this test. And I'd say, okay, do this, I'd put, put the magazine in. And every time after every step, I'd ask them the same questions, right? Is there a round in the chamber? Is the firearm cocked? And what would happen if you pull the trigger now? Mm -hmm. And they'd have to answer those questions. Then I'd get them to do the next thing, right? Rack the slide. I'd ask them those questions again. So all I did was really I took that test that I'd given in real life and I just made a video test out of it.
Mm. And, you know, it hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, yeah, really. Well, I mean, I've, I mean, I have always, I've always thought it was just such a perfect idea. I mean, you're, you're just, you're just one guy in a skyscraper in Wichita with the word human factors written on it with waiting for a brick to come through the window window office on the fourth floor. <laughs> but um, it, it's an ivory tower too, by the yes. way, they actually built the whole thing out of ivory, ivory. beautiful structure. Yep. Um, lots of, but, uh, lots of um, elephants around here. In Wichita. <laughs> uh, but, in in a in a perfect world where again you would think that i would think that as a gun owner i would want myself if i had kids my kids my by anyone in my home my neighbors anyone else that had a gun to also know if they pull the trigger on their gun, hmm. what what happens in a certain situation? Does it yeah. go off when you want it to and not go off when it does? And and could there be some sort of a driver's license? I, I think, doesn't Japan have like some sort of situation where you can get a gun, but there's like fairly strict testing huh. and I'm I'm not sure what place? the situation is over there. I, I, I have heard that it's very difficult to get firearms over there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how they do it. But you know, there's, there's, there's lots of examples of other countries in the world where there's a lot of guns. Mm -hmm. And they have less, less instances or incidents of people unintentionally discharging them. That kind of thing. Do you, is it like cultural thing? Maybe you don't even want to spec, this might not be your, your thing, but are there, are there different, um, like, what is it? Sweden or something like that? that Switzerland that has, has, or Switzerland. Yeah. yeah because, they, because, um, I'm not sure of the current situation, but at least at some time males had to serve in the, in the military. So they, you know, they generally had weapons training and they, even after their military service, they would, they get a gun issued to keep at home um, for, for civil defense kind of reasons. And so I, I think that that's often held up as, a, as an example of a country where there is there are a lot of guns, but they're used very differently and people mm. people seem to, to treat them differently. It's just that 2020, you've had this huge surge and like pe people that probably never thought they were going to own a gun in their entire life, right. all, all of a sudden going out and like, well, uh, I changed my mind. This, yeah. is, and, this is the time. And, and I keep, I, I find that, um, you know, there's proud gun owners who, you know, that they have guns because they put stickers all over the back of their, their pickup and that kind of thing. But there's, I've, I've been surprised to find out, you know, some people who don't advertise the fact, but that, ha that have guns, people who I wouldn't expect. And I just, I just generally think, I mean, compared to Australia, it's a lot more prevalent here, but I think it's maybe even beyond what I expect. I think mm. that a lot of people, even who I wouldn't necessarily think might have a gun, have a gun for, for self-defense reasons, mm. because they think that they, that they really need it. And maybe, and maybe they do, depending on, you know, where they live and, and who they are. Um, but it, it makes for a, a, a bit of a different society. Mm -hmm. Do you have, uh, do you have, uh, I mean, has your research, uh, made you conclude that you wish we did any policy changes differently in any way? So I'm incredibly biased when it comes to that, just because I grew up in Australia. Yeah, that's so you know what I, I can tell you what I think. But, you know, someone who's born in America, thinks right. thinks the opposite just because <laughs> because they because they grew up here so you know i i grew i grew up in a place where there were, there's no such thing as having a web carrying a weapon for self defense forget about guns knives you can't carry a knife 
for so you can't you don't people don't carry knives around in in Australia. I, look, I'm sure that there's some people that do, but generally, I mean, you can get stopped by the police and get in trouble for for having a knife. You call that a knife? That's no, not a knife. It's not a, that's this not is a knife. knife. So uh, <laughs> nice one. My my graduate students never fail to bring that up. I, oh, I know, <laughs> but I was trying to put a clever spin on it of and like trying to hide the knife rather than show it off. Yes. I just had I didn't quite get the word the wording figured out, but after this podcast, I'm going to workshop <laughs> that, and uh, the, the next time I have you on, I'm going to give go. you one that you haven't heard before. So I, I, um, <laughs> I haven't. What do I want to say? That you know, for for me, I don't see an issue with that. Is going to get me into trouble, but who cares? Uh, you don't even need to say anything. It doesn't matter. No, it, no, I, I I don't I don't think it's an issue. Just you know, when in Australia, it doesn't seem outrageous to say that if you want a firearm, you have to have one of these valid reasons for having it. Yeah. Self defense is not on that list. You have to belong to a club or an organization. You have to get training. You have to store it appropriately. The police can come and check, Mm -hmm. you know, that that you've got the gun, that that you're meant to have, that it's stored appropriately, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. That to me, like that's normal. That's that's reasonable. That everything's Mm -hmm. registered, and but I understand that here in America, that's it's a very different situation. So. Yeah, there. I mean, it's there's it, it, for for any any um, any gun fans out there, which I'm sure there are plenty listening that that are like, that's crazy. T-. It, I mean, you don't need to you don't need to panic too much. I think we're a long ways <laughs> from. <laughs> let's cross that bridge <laughs> when when we get there. We'll yeah. see if we outlaw bazookas first, and then we'll <laughs> we'll see. That's a good gonna. place to start. Um, uh, so, so in terms of, uh, as, as we wrap up here <laughs> in, in terms of some things that you're excited about, maybe, um, uh, work that you've done that might be implemented in police training, what would you, what has shown promise that you would like to see uh, larger sample sizes, maybe implemented <clears throat> more broadly? Um, so one of the one of the things is this work that I've been doing for the last couple of years together with my graduate students, where we look at people's ability, police officers' ability, to distinguish between someone drawing a gun and someone drawing, uh, say, a cell phone or a wallet. And so you know, we're we're on video at the moment, but if I, you know, I yeah. show you this kind of situation where I've got my hand behind my back and, you know, imagine a a kind of tense police standoff and the police officer doesn't know if I've got a gun or don't have a gun and then I go to, you know, do this motion and puts the police officer in a really, really tough spot, right? Because, you know, we're talking about responding, being able to identify what this object is within, you know, a split second is this a drunk magician who thinks he's funny and uh, it's a handful of confetti? Exactly. Or, or someone who doesn't even have, he's got a finger gun, as in, I've just got, I don't have a gun. But, yeah. You know, there's these, I, there's these suicide by cop situations. Right. Right. So I'll just pull my finger out. Or we've seen instances where someone's got a cell phone in their hand or a wallet and It may not even be a suicide by cop situation. It just may be that the, that the person has a cell phone in their hand, but the officers mistook it as a a weapon. And that, that's happened. There's been, um, quite a few instances of, of that happening. And there's, there's a name for those kind of things. Um, threat perception errors or mistake of fact shootings. And so we've been looking at that. Um, mainly from the on the basis of research that's been done in sport that looks at anticipation. So one of the things, 50 years worth of research in sport that shows that expert players, let's take, for example, tennis players, 
they're better at anticipating where someone's going to serve the ball to. Is it going to go to my forehand side or my backhand side? And they can read it earlier in their op in their opponent's kind of serve motion. So it gives them that split second to, to move in the right direction. So I'm looking using those kind of methods to look at this in law enforcement. So we mm. basically filmed some people um, drawing weapons and non-weapons from different places on their body. And... These are just, you know, I got some actors, paid them, paid them pizza, paid them in pizza and, and filmed them doing this. And then take those videos. You can imagine any time someone does that kind of motion where they're standing with their hand behind their back and I give them a signal to, to pull this object out and aim it at the camera, it's, it's a pretty quick motion. It's just, you know, within two seconds it's over. So I take that video, that two-second video, and I chop it up. I make different versions of it. We can imagine the start of that video. I make a version where I cut it off. I make it stop as soon as the person's arm starts to move. And then I make another version which shows a few frames more. And then another version that shows a few frames more. And so I have these multiple versions of this action. And I've got, the, I've got it with weapons and non-weapons, different locations, different actors. And I throw all of them into an experiment, kind of present those things randomly to people and just ask them to indicate when the video cuts off and goes to a black screen, do you think that the person's drawing a weapon or a non-weapon? Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're doing that. We've collected data now from uh, experienced police officers, uh, recruits, uh, security guards, college students, we're just in the process of analyzing that. And so that, so that's one thing that I'm excited about. And that could potentially lead to some training for police officers that, you know, if we find out that there are people who are better at this than other people, like, for example, more experienced police officers, then we can try and identify, well, what cues are they paying attention to in this in these videos is it the angle of the elbow is it the shoulder position those kind of things and if we can identify those then we could potentially design a training program that might help people perform better in those situations but i mean let's put it in context we don't want to be in those situations anyway they're they're terrible situations to have to be faced off in or to encounter but maybe there's something that we can do to help that that kind of thing and we've we've done an extension of that where instead of just using regular video and filming people we did motion capture so the kind of thing that they do when they make animated movies if you've seen those uh, kind of suits those body yeah, thing suits. You put, you put the little ping pong balls all e over here exactly so i i collaborated with uh, with another professor um, Nils Hackinson here at Wichita State University. He's in biomedical engineering and he's got a motion capture lab. And so we did that. We captured someone, you know, drawing different objects. And so now all you see is a completely uh, black background and you just see kind of a white ball or a white dot on their ankles, knees, hips, wrist, elbow, shoulders, and, and one in the center of their head. And so because now that removes everything. It removes what the person looks like, what clothes they're wearing, their facial expression, all that kind of stuff. So I'm in the process of, of doing some of that. And That's really interesting. Because uh, it's my understanding. And by the way, you throw the weirdest pizza parties. Yeah. <laughs> well. Like, hey, everyone want to come over? I just need you to uh, do some quick put your hand behind your yeah. back. And, uh, um, but. The, I I've seen on um, just just some uh, some some smaller studies or like some stuff I've seen on TV about some of these studies is is that it, like relating to the race AIT stuff. What is uh, the uh, intuitive association? Implicit test, association. Uh, implicit test. associate. Yeah, implicit. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, Harpy Eagle implicit association test. Um, and uh, they that that there is there there is a kind of a difference in response depending on ethnicity and yes. and then some of it and and it does show that that. Uh, 
my understanding is that is that experienced police officers do as you would hope do much much better in these kind of simulations than than just your average person that's that's right. never stepped into one of these um before but there but there is a uh measurable it's, difference right and i've intentionally chosen not to look at race as a as kind of a factor or, or look at it from from that perspective yeah um one of the reasons is that i think that's just it's a very fraught area and mm -hmm. um it's there's people who, who do research in that and I think that there's enough people who do research in that that they don't need Joel Suss to come right, in right. and do that. I mean, you Wait. you understand it would like if we didn't <laughs> mention it. It's like it's sure. obviously a gap. It's, so, it's something listeners and, are are thinking about. And and so the way that I've looked at it is, um, a lot of that research, especially the the earlier research in that area, um lacks what we call kind of ecological validity in that mm. they used static images, photos of people in kind of, I think, corny poses with guns and, and, and non-weapons and they'd Photoshop them on, on different backgrounds, right? The dingy alleyway versus, um, yeah. you know, a, a nice park. And I don't know, to, you know, there, there may be some value in that kind of thing. I'm looking at it from a little bit of a different perspective. I'm trying yeah. to look at it in motion from this. We call it perceptual cognitive expertise. A lot, you know, that's, a lot of this has been done in sport to try to understand, is there expertise? Are there people who are good at discriminating between these things? I think it's very tough, very, very tough to do. Um, yeah. And then... Can we isolate? If they can, then can we isolate what it is that they're paying attention to? Can we use kind that? of like uh, in the uh, like we we go to high five and and people are like, well, if you really want to nail the high five, you look at the <laughs> elbow and then you hit it each time. This exactly. kind of counterintuitive thing that that maybe maybe your uh, um, ping pong ball suit golem guy <laughs> is going to uh, that that's um, waving the fake gun around is you're going to be able to zero in and then perhaps with the aid of uh increased technology with vr and then you maybe you can track people's eye movement to yes. see what the most exactly. accurate people are paying exactly. attention to maybe it's something within the hips or or a foot that they're uh, that hey, you would have never noticed you want a job with no money <laughs> yeah. come and uh, come and work uh, with uh, me on this research uh, sweeten the deal a little <laughs> a bit pizza. more than a no pizza? <laughs> i gotta feed me a little bit uh, better than pizza each day those do sound like fun pizza parties though um but but this is this is the idea this is what could be exciting is you could have a, 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 these simulations could get could get better and better and much in the way that uh th that uh, uh, that pilots get better and better simulations for yeah for for cases that they'll hopefully never even encounter um police will be able to do the same uh, i hope so and you know one of the, the the neat things is that there's an idea of the perception and action are linked so I could, one way of training people is that I, you know, work out what the experts are looking at and I design some kind of training program with videos where I show them this and try and get them to hone in on whatever it is, the elbow or the ankle, whatever is the, the, the key piece of information. But there's another side of it that says that if people get experience doing that motion themselves, they should be better at anticipating someone else's actions. Ah. And so police very rarely act like bad guys ah. and have and have weapons or, you know That's brilliant. Get get put in the situation where, hey, you're a, you know, a suicide by cop situation and you want to kind of deceive the police officer into thinking that the wallet that you're gonna pull is a gun, right? Who practices that? Who yeah. who practices that? But, but 
potentially, right, theoretically, if people get practice at doing those different things, pulling a gun, like p- police very rarely get to practice pulling a gun from a concealed position that where it's not stored in a holster, where it's just stuffed into the back of their pants, right? If they get practice doing those kind of things, see what they what that feels like, theoretically that might help them be better at anticipating someone who's doing that. Mm, that's amazing. And I hate to ruin the perfect <laughs> cutoff point to add one more silly thing, but I'm now obsessed with the suicide by gun. I've like, cause I've never, I've thought of all the ways, like, what do you do? Like, would getting hit by a bus be as bad as people like me? Why are, why are people always comparing to things to getting hit by a bus? Are people getting hit by that? And I'm like, what would I do? I, I, I'm terminally ill. You jump off a cliff. You go morphine. You oh. sit in a you sit in a garage uh, with, with, with the, the car, car going. You hanging yourself. Who does that? That seems crazy. That what a painful last few. And I've never thought that. Death by cop, that's a ballsy, so, well, there's a little bit of, I think it's like in the situation, right? They're getting they're getting chased and then they don't want to, they've decided to themselves they don't want to go in or something? No, no, I mean, um, it, that, that could happen that way. But I just, you know, have been watching a stack of videos, you know, and again, I mentioned selection bias of the kind of videos yeah. that are, but it just astounded me how many people were there pleading with the police to shoot them. Please shoot me. Just shoot me. Just shoot me. I I, I don't want to keep, kill me. Please kill me. And then walking at the police with, you know, with a knife or something like that, trying to get the police to shoot them. So I, I you know, we, going back to what we spoke about at the beginning about clinical psychology and that kind of thing, yeah. I, I know – Uh, I'm the worst person to ask about anything, you know, clinical depression and things like that. I'm not knowledgeable about that at all. But what you said compared to, you know, getting, you know, walking in front of a bus, the thing is to walk in front of a bus needs you to walk in front of a bus. It needs you to commit the action. Yeah, yeah. This is you're kind of you're putting it in someone else's hands. Yeah, someone else is pulling the lever. Right. You you don't have to do it. So it But still that's so like, you know what? I just I I've I you know, it's uh it's been it's been nice. I I've had a I've had a fun time. I, like I get where things are going. I peaked. I'm just kind of you know what? I'm going to take a gamble. Either today I die or I end up with a bullet in my shoulder in 20 years in prison. Like that's that's such a crazy plan. I could see if you're like, "Well, I don't want to uh, I I robbed a bank and I don't want to be taken alive." I get that, but to like sit and plan that up. And, uh, holy no, smokes. I, I never thought of that one before. I, I'm, now I'm, I'm not obsessed. Sure. I don't know the extent to which people plan that or whether okay. it just it it kind of it, happens in the moment but but the thing yeah. is that you know this is people who are gr- hugely in distress right this is this is it's not normal you know right. regular behavior these are people who are really um suffering and and you know have some mental mental illness issues and i've had manic episodes in my life i've done some real crazy things so just nothing nothing violent but i i i know what it's like to go <laughs> completely insane and lose your mind and there was even one video that i watched i would never have believed this it it starts with a 911 call a, uh-huh. a guy is saying you know I'm, I'm i'm driving to work and i just you know passed a guy on the street he's got a gun and he's talking with 911 and describes the situation where he is exactly. And they go, okay, we've, we, we've got officers on the way. And then you see the officers, you know, turn up, there's body cameras, and they encounter this guy. And he's got a, his hand in his pocket and they're telling him, take your hand out of your pocket and you know, do all this kind of thing. Initially, they thought that that was the guy who had called 911 and he was going to, you know, tell them 
where is this person who's got the knife? And it turned out to be it turned out to be the person who called nine one one. They called nine one one, pretending, mm-hmm. right, the dead scene right. someone, but it, they wanted the police called onto them. Yeah, yeah. There's a madman with a knife here. And so, and the and then and then you <laughs> right. and then and then you and then you realize that that's the, wow. the police realize this is the guy, and he's just saying, "Shoot me, please, please shoot me." Yeah. And it's wow. I mean, you know, something amazing. A big a big well, part of the thing is you know dealing with re- reducing the incidence of mental illness. Yeah, of course. God, so many factors. Well, thank you, Joel. You were once again such a fantastic guest. I, I, I thank you for, uh, for joining me. I'm, I'm sure it's been a tense year for, uh, for your field of research and and uh, different journalists and stuff like that reaching out to you for, for your take on things probably more than uh, normal. So I, I appreciate you. Uh, taking the time to uh, share some of your research and perspectives. Well, thank you for inviting me back on. It's 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 been really fun, and uh, I this really, was a really good episode. I think I think people really really liked this. It's certainly, if they've listened to this long, they've they must have been getting <laughs> they something must, out yes. of it. <laughs> cool. uh, and we went on for for longer than I even told you we would. So I've taken advantage of your time, and it, and I'm I'm sure it was worth it for the listener. Thank you so much for joining me, Joel Suss. Everybody, check out the links where I'll put the test that Joel will uh, will email me. And uh, and yeah, thank you just for being wonderful, curious people that like uh, science literacy and learning about such a variety of subjects. We'll talk with you next week. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode. I thought it was a real fun one. I hope that I've, uh, you know, I, I try my best to have, um, you know, sensible, logical, uh, conversations, try to have reasonable conversations and be open about my own biases, but also try to be open, um, to, uh, working past them when they're in the way of, uh, perceiving, um, reality in a more accurate way. And, uh, and, and so I, I know that, uh, that guns and, and, um, and police training and everything are, are an especially divisive, uh, topic at the moment. And so I, I, I hope that you, you found this to be, um, a sensible approach, but I'm always open to suggestions. Um, I, I thought it was, uh, 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 a, a pretty, um, uh, interesting and, and sensible conversation. So I hope you feel the same way. And if you don't, that's okay too. Thanks for listening all this way. And, uh, uh thanks for any support on Patreon. I'm trying out a board game night. Going to play Code Names. I don't know if you guys have ever played Code Names. It's just a fun, easy word association game. Simple rules, but super cerebral and, and creative. And uh, and uh, just kind of a, a fun way to hang out without having to worry about... Um, yeah, I've been experimenting with several different ways of like getting people together and uh, do, doing more things for Patreon and more bonuses and stuff. And uh, I'm looking forward to trying out this uh, interesting, fun way because playing board games is like less, less socially anxious and stuff for me as well. Just a fun way to hang out and, and play some games. So still experimenting, just about to... By the time you're listening to this, it's probably not done, but keep an eye out for my Discord. Even if you don't support me on Patreon, I think that I'm going to open my Discord up um, because I'm not like, uh, you know, I don't have as many followers as like, uh, uh, say, Duncan Trussell or something that that uh, advised me to start a pod, uh, Discord and, and put it behind a paywall. 
uh it's been cool and it's been fun and been awesome to offer like a little extra something for uh for the longtime listeners for the patreon supporters and everything else and and it was nice to like have that kind of paywall barrier to um to eliminate um trolls but I, I think that there's other ways of uh, of doing that, and I, I don't think that trolls are, are going to be as susceptible to finding their way into uh, my community because usually the people that listen to this show are uh, um, fantastic, intelligent, curious, um, reasonable people. So uh, should be opening up the Discord to the public. So even if you don't have the money to support on Patreon, um just write me for for a discord link at least even even if you go and if you follow on i think you can follow me on patreon without contributing and just send me a message on there that you want to link i th uh, sorry that i'm not tech savvy enough to have everything worked out much easier than this and i'm kind of doing a lot on my own and learning a lot of things but i'll uh get you a link and you can join in the community and lots more to come those of you that listen all the way to the end you are of course my favorites